Hey guys, how are you tonight? I would like to re <laughs> Good, good. I would like to read some scripture for you guys from Luke chapter 6, verses 39 and 40. He also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Give it up for Cassandra. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Great. You guys are really excited tonight, right here, just you three. Uh, super glad to be with you guys tonight. Uh, if I have not had the chance to meet you yet, I would love to do that. Uh, I think we have a slide with a QR code on it. Uh, this is just a way to make it super easy for you guys to have a chance to grab lunch or coffee. If you scan the uh, slide that has the QR code, it'll give you some options to meet with me, and I would love to buy you coffee or lunch, just hang out with you, get to know you. And a lot of you just said, oh, free food, free coffee. Uh, but seriously, I mean it. I want to get to meet you guys and get to know you guys a lot better. So feel free to take me up on that offer. Anytime you want, just scan that. It gives you some options. Um, if I have not had the chance to meet you yet, my name is TJ. I get to hang out on Wednesday nights with you guys and just get to talk about Jesus, and I love doing it. One other thing I want to highlight before we jump in tonight is camp deadline is coming up soon. So if you guys are excited about youth camp, who's excited about youth camp? A lot of you guys are excited, but here's something not so exciting. You guys got two weeks left to sign up, and not all of you are signed up yet. So start signing up. You got two weeks left. Uh, March 1st is the deadline. If you don't have your pumpkin patch hours or anything like that, just let me know before you leave tonight, and we'll make sure you get that. Sound good? Awesome. Uh, just to kind of recap where we're at in the series, we are in a three-week conversation uh, under this idea of practicing the way of Jesus on becoming like him. And we first talked about that we are becoming something or someone, right? You guys remember that from a couple of weeks ago? That just being human means being changed and becoming like something or like someone else. And then last week, we talked about becoming like Jesus, what that actually looks like, and said that becoming like Jesus is becoming a person of love, you guys remember that? We talked about the Sermon on the Mount and all those characteristics and what it looks like to actually look like Jesus. And tonight, we're going to get a little bit more practical with it. We're going to talk about how we become like him. We're going to get into a little bit of a theory of change and talk about what it looks like to do that. So let's pray and let's jump in. Uh, Jesus, thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for just a great night to come worship you, Lord, and get to know you and get to know how to become like you. So Father, that's our prayer tonight, Lord. Open our eyes to how we can do that. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So quick question for you guys to start. Is anybody in here a runner? By just a show of hands. Like actually a runner, not like you run like occasionally, like you're a runner. How many of you guys have, I think this is probably going to be less hands, run a marathon before? Pam just came from one, that's why she's got the walker. A couple of you guys, have you actually ran a marathon? Are you lying to me? Okay, so you, you know how intense training for a marathon is then if you're telling the truth. Training to run a marathon is super intense. Uh, has anybody known somebody that's run a marathon if you have not ran one? A few of you guys? Okay, so you guys are kind of familiar maybe with the process of becoming the kind of person who can run a marathon, right? It's super intense. So basically, one of the like, most recommended ways to learn how to run a marathon is you take like a five-day cycle, and on like Monday you run, say, a mile to start. And then Tuesday you push yourself a little bit further, like say a mile and a quarter. Wednesday a mile and a half. And then Thursday you go back to a mile, and then on Friday, you go for another whole mile further. So you go two miles. And you just kind of keep repeating this and repeating this. But the thing that makes you learn, learn to run further is that your Friday becomes your next Monday. So on Friday, if you ran two miles, you then run two miles on Monday and just keep pushing yourself and training further until eventually the average amount of miles you run in a week is about 50 miles per week. Anybody currently doing that? No. Sheldon, you're lying. Don't lie to me right now. Uh, and when I think about running a marathon and the training that goes into it, I think it's like intense, right? That's a lot of work. It requires intentionality and it requires like training, just like straight up. You can't just try to run a marathon. If, we, if any of us who are not training for that right now try to run a marathon, we all would be in the ER together the next day. Like it's just a fact. You, you raising your hand like you doubt that or you saying you agree? You don't know? Uh, but when I think of like intense and intentional training, there's two people that come to mind for me. And you guys might know these people. I think of The Rock and Mark Wahlberg, right? They're both huge men. They both work out a lot. They're known for being like these action figures in movies and in TV shows. And so you think it's kind of funny, but I know he's the guy from Fortnite. I know. I know what you're thinking about it. There we go. I was waiting for somebody to say it. 
Uh, but in all seriousness, though, when you think about them, they have some of the most intense, like, publicly known training regimens and diet regimens out there. Uh, the Rock, in particular, when he was talking about his role as Black Adam, he said that he had to train and diet harder than he has ever had to in his career and manipulate water, sodium, and cardio while pushing and pulling real iron constantly in order to get into that kind of shape to become the Black Adam. He had to eat seven protein-rich meals, totaling over 4,100 calories. And if you're not familiar with what that means, that's twice the daily recommended amount for a man. It's a lot. His average meal would consist of 10 ounces of meat, two cups of a side, but like an oatmeal in the morning, or rice and veggies for his other meals. It would usually include multiple eggs, and then he would usually finish it with a protein shake. And then he would often end his day by eating 10 eggs and having another protein shake. 10 e yep, you heard that right, 10 eggs. It's a whole carton. It's like $8 of eggs right there he just ate just as a snack before bed. Uh, his meals were kind of crazy. His training would be just as intense. His warm-up was an hour-long run. How many of you guys think you could run for an hour straight right now if you tried? Nope. Handful of you? That's his warm-up. So he would do that, and then he would work out for an hour. It's intense, yeah. He would do this kind of rotation where he would start with high-intensity leg training. So he would do a lot of reps of pretty decent weight on his legs. And the next day, he would switch to low reps, high weight on all of his upper body. And the next day, he would do that again. And then he'd do back and abs. And then he would do legs again. Except this time, he'd push himself and do high reps and high weight on legs the next time. And then he just kind of did this constantly. And on day seven, he would rest. And he jokingly said that the way he rests on day seven is he eats ice cream sandwiches. So I think that's one way that we can all relate to The Rock and his workout regimen is we can all eat ice cream sandwiches on day seven, right? Right? Uh, Mark Wahlberg, his is actually a little bit more intentional and intense, at least what we publicly know about it, which some of you are like, how? He eats 7,000 calories a day. What was the number I said before, those of you paying attention? 4,100? 7,000. So it's almost a whole other person worth, actually almost two more people worth of calories a day. Uh, to do this, he said that he would eat 20 chicken nuggets and 20 hot wings and get six beverages from KFC. Again, something that we could all probably aspire to, right? We could all aspire to that. Uh, we could diet like Mark Wahlberg and just eat more KFC. That's, that's the point of the message. You guys can go home now. Uh, all jokes aside, it gets even more intense than that. He would wake up at 2.30 a.m. Yes, a.m. I know most of you guys probably sleep at 2.30 p.m. if you had the choice. He wakes up at 2.30 a.m. by choice. And by 3.15, he's already eating breakfast of steel oats, peanut butter, blueberries, and eggs. And then from 3.40 to 5.15, he's doing his first workout. Key word here. First workout. And what that would usually look like is an hour of him working out, and then he would finish at 5.30 to have his second breakfast. And after he has his second breakfast, he would have his first protein shake. And then his second breakfast usually consisted of three turkey burgers. Not three eggs, three turkey burgers. It's a lot of food, right? A lot of, a lot of protein early in the morning. Did I mention that's before 5.30 a.m.? I don't know if I forgot that or not. Just important information. And then he would golf for two hours at 7.30. So golf is, it's fun. It's a workout. Uh, he would do that. And then he'd get in a cryo chamber for an hour for recovery. And then at 10.30, he would have his third breakfast. This one consisting of grilled chicken salad with two hard-boiled eggs, avocado, olives, cucumbers, and tomatoes. Sounds pretty good, right? But that's his breakfast. It's third breakfast. That's the key thing to keep in mind. And then he would work until about 1, and then he would kind of start working out again. So at 3.30, he would have a snack of grilled chicken and bok choy as a like, pregame for his second workout at 4 o'clock. And then he would work out for an hour. And then at 5.30, he would have dinner, which is usually a lot of fish, some veggies, and more bok choy. And then he would go for a light jog and then go to bed at 8 p.m. So then he would wake up at 2.30 and do that again. It's intense, right? Did I mention that that's not like him training for a movie? That's just what he does, like, daily? So, like, what I was talking about with The Rock, that was his, like, training for Black Adam. That's what the Mark Wahlberg does on a daily basis. So, like, if you just showed up at his house, you're going to see him doing what I just described. It's intense, right? The key thing I want to point out in both those guys' lives, though, is that it's intentional, right? You don't do those things on accident. You don't decide to wake up at 2.30 on accident and start working out and eating 14 meals a day. They lived intentional lives that they oriented around who they wanted to become. They changed their whole life and changed their whole diet and the way they exercise all around who they wanted to become. And I think that you and I can learn something from them about how to become like Jesus. 
we can reorient our lives and live our lives so intentionally where we can become like Jesus in a similar fashion. And if we go back to our key verse tonight that Cassandra read for us again, go Cassandra. Woo. Uh, in Luke 6, 39 to 40, Jesus said this. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. The truth in this brief parable here from Jesus has several layers to it that we'll unpack throughout the night. But the thing that I really want to start with is that you're already training for something and becoming something or someone, and we need to anchor in this truth because we can train to become like Jesus, right? We can train to become like him, and the implication here is that there are layers to that. There's levels to it almost. We are training. So there's like the blinds that we are learning about Jesus. There's the students so we are starting to train. There is the fully trained, which implies naturally there is a partially trained, right? If you could be fully trained, there's a season of life where you're partially trained. And then there's a season where you're the teacher and you're helping others become trained too. Jesus is getting at here is that we can often get stuck at being a student because we follow the wrong voices or go down the wrong path, but we can become fully trained. We can become like him and help others do the same thing. The real problem I see here in life, like I've lived in this experience too, is we often get stuck at student because we don't know how to train to become like Jesus, right? We learn about him. We start doing some things from him or things that we see him do in his life. And then we kind of just like stop there. And maybe we hit a wall. Uh, maybe things get a little hard or we forget to read our Bible for a couple of days and we just kind of stop. And we don't often train for becoming like Jesus, like we train to run a marathon or like Mark Wahlberg trains or like The Rock trains or like you guys train for jobs you might start or for sports teams you're on or even for the academic part of your lives. We all are training for things already, but we often don't train when it comes to following Jesus. We often just try harder, right? By show of hands, like how many of you guys have said, like, I just need to try a little bit harder at this. And by a show of hands, how many of you said that and have let yourself down? It's because you're not supposed to just try harder. You're supposed to be training for it. You're supposed to be living a life intentionally oriented around training to become like Jesus. It's not about training. It's, about, it's not about trying. It's about training. So tonight, uh, if you're a Christian or not, if you're not really sure about Jesus and you're in the room, don't check out. Just tune in because what we're about to talk about doesn't just apply to Christians. It's literally a theory of change that's just been applied to following Jesus. So basically it means if you want to become anything in life, you can look at what we're about to talk about and apply it to that and it will help you become like that person or like that thing. But we're talking about it in light of Jesus tonight. Uh, so going back to our conversation from the first week of this uh, conversation around becoming like Jesus, we said that you are becoming someone already and we don't really have a say in that unless we decide to. So the implication of that, the way that kind of plays out is that there is unintentional formation in our lives, right? There is times where we are unintentionally becoming like Jesus or becoming like something. And if the only thing that you did was basically wake up and live and breathe, you become like someone. That's what the unintentional side of what we're about to talk about is uh, going to be looking at. So right at the top, if you guys see a little image on your notes, you see like two pyramids. Uh, right at the top, you will see where it says stories or you'll have a blank to fill in says stories. So right there at the top, one of the first things that is forming you in lives is the stories that you believe. This speaks to the things in your life that like you believe about America. So like if you were born in America and you grew up in America, then you think America's great. If you're born in another country and grew up in another country, you think that country's great. If you grew up rooting for a sports team, you believe a story that sports team's good. And if you're a Red Sox fan, you really believe it's good and it's not true and I'm sorry. Just, I'm just being honest with you guys tonight. Um, the history tells otherwise, but we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but basically, the stories you believe are from like the things you listen to, the things you consume, the way that you're raised, these stories that you hear throughout your life that you believe deeply shape who you become. If you believe that the Red Sox are a good sports franchise, you are a bad baseball fan. Uh, just poking fun. But in all of this, like all these things that you believe, the stories that you hear and live into shape you at a deep level. And then if you move over to the other side, you'll see another blank where you could put the word habits. And this is super simple. You all likely know by now that your habits shape you, right? If you wake up early, you're more likely to be an early morning person and discipline, right? Like how many of you guys wake up early now outside of school to do something on purpose? 
<laughs> some of you guys are like, uh, <laughs> so some of you guys wake up early to do something when it's not school, right? Like you'd wake up to go for a run, for work maybe. So there you go. There's a lot more of you guys are understanding. And if you decide to not do that, maybe you decide to stay up until 2, 3 in the morning playing Xbox or watching Netflix or on your phone, scrolling TikTok, right? You're more likely to be the kind of person who's going to sleep until 2 p.m. because you're doing these habits that are leading to you not getting enough sleep and having to sleep in. Uh, one thing that I do that my wife and family hate is I bite my nails. It's just kind of like this tick. Does anybody else do that too? I, I, last time I said this, you were like super proud of yourself and you are again. I love it. Uh, it's just one of these habits and it deeply shapes us where like if I'm bored and I don't really know what to do, I'll just start biting my nails. It's a habit that has shaped me where it's like if I'm bored, it just kind of happens. Our habits change us for little things like that and for big things. And then on the other side of this pyramid, you'll see the word relationships in the blank that you could put there. And this one is very simple. Uh, just kind of at a base level, if you have somebody that you were a friend with, you most likely chose to be their friend because you had something in common with them, right? Or you thought they were cool, or you thought that they were fun to talk to, or they were easygoing, right? Like how many of you guys have friends like that? Like should be just about every hand, or you're not paying attention, right? You all have friends that you picked because you just have chemistry with them, you like them, you like doing things with them. Uh, but relationships really do shape us. I know one pastor always says, like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. There's truth in that. Your friend group shapes you and it shapes the direction you're going in life. And the difference here in relationships and some other words we might use here is relationships are usually based on just that. It's usually based on just, like, chemistry. You like them. You think they're cool. You like doing things with them. And that's it. And then if you look at the pyramid, right in the middle, I want you guys to write the word environment. Environment. Anybody know where we live and where we're at church right now? Loxahatchee, Florida. How many people are wearing camo or boots right now? Proudly standing up over there in the back. Got boots over here, I'm assuming. Any other boots or camo in the room? How many of you guys own boots or camo and you just did not wear it tonight? A lot more hands. How many of you have a cowboy hat at home maybe? How many of you drive a truck? How many of you, your truck is lifted? How many of you drive like an SUV and you lifted it like you think you have a truck? How many of you guys fish? How many of you hunt? How many of you guys have swam in a canal? <laughs> the more hands went up for that than most of the other things I said. That's kind of concerning. Uh, but the point of this is to say, like, your environment is Locks Hatchie, Florida. This is where you grew up. This is where you live. So that's kind of who you become, right? If you lived out in downtown West Palm, you would not be wearing cowboy boots, wearing camo, swimming in canals, right? That's just not how life works. Your environment shapes you. And you become like your environment and you become like the people in your environment. And again, all of this side of this equation, the unintentional side of the conversation, just happens to you when you wake up and you live and you breathe and you go to school, you go to work maybe, you play in your sports team. This is just what happens as you are human. And then if you also remember from the first week of our conversation, we did say you are becoming somebody, but you can't have a say. And this is where we start to talk about that with intentional formation. So the intentional side, you could basically think of it as like the counter side of the other one. So you are being unintentionally formed or you can choose to be counterformed, to be intentionally formed by choosing different things that'll shape you in a different way than you already are being shaped. And right at the top, you'll see the word, I'll see a blank and I want you to write the word teaching there. Write teaching. And essentially what this is, is to counter or fight back against the stories that you believe in your life. Uh, so if you think about this like super practical level, like you're, you're under teaching right now, if you go to church on Sunday, you're under teaching with other Pastor Dale or Trevor or Jessica, whoever's preaching. If you go to another church on Sunday, you're under their teaching. If you listen to a podcast from a church or somebody you'd like that's a Christian, you're under teaching. At school, you're under teaching. If you listen to watch or anything that teaches you about something, you're under what? Teaching. teaching. Good job. You guys are paying attention. All of this is to say is like teaching pays a pivotal role in shaping us as well. And if we do it intentionally, we can use it to counterform against the stories we believe that might not line up with the life of Jesus or his way of life. And if you just think of it practically, it's like we use the example of like, if you're born and raised in America, you think America is great. That's not necessarily against the way of Jesus, but we are taught in scripture and under good teaching in a church that the kingdom of God is primary. So if you listen to sound teaching and you are under a church authority and listening to pastors or podcasts or reading books, you can counter these narratives that aren't necessarily bad, aren't necessarily evil, but aren't just necessarily Jesus either. 
And then on the other side, on the bottom, you'll see the word, you'll see a blank. I want you to write the word practices there. And some of you guys might be thinking like, what's the difference between a habit and a practice? Habits are these kind of things that are we just like are naturally doing and they become patterns versus practices are things that we choose to do. So like how many athletes in the room of any sport kind at all? Don't raise your hand, Sydney, you golf, it doesn't count. <laughs> I'm just joking. I did see you raise your hand, so I had to make the joke. Uh, so you guys all have practice for your sports, right? So you guys all have practice for your sports, right? Yes. So for practice for your sport, you are choosing to do these things. You are choosing to practice the sport you are playing so you can become better at it, so you can become a better basketball player or football player or soccer player or baseball player or softball player, whatever it might be for you. Practice shapes you into that kind of person. And if we want to become like Jesus, we don't just go about our normal habits that we have in our lives, biting our nails or sleeping in, whatever it might be. We choose the practices of Jesus to become like him, just like we choose the practices of our sport to become like that kind of athlete. You choose to read your Bible. You choose to pray. You choose to fast. You choose to Sabbath. You choose to sit in silence with God. And so many other practices that we could point to from church tradition, we choose to practice as ways of shaping our loves and our attention back to Jesus so that we could become like him. And again, like we said a few times, this is all about training. If you try to fast... How many of you have tried that before? It's hard, right? How many of you guys have tried to fast and have failed? It's hard. You have to train to become the kind of person who could fast so that you could become like Jesus. How many of you guys have tried to read your Bible? How many of you guys have failed once or twice? You have to train at it. You have to do it consistently. And if we do these things, if we lean into these practices, we can become more like Jesus. And then on the other side of this uh, paradigm, at the bottom of the triangle, you'll write the word community. So instead of relationships, it's community. And again, you might be asking yourself, what's the difference between the two? That's like just two interchangeable words. And to some extent, that's true. But the way that we're looking at tonight is a little different. Like we said, relationships are predominantly based on chemistry, liking that person, liking to hang out with that person, do things with that person. Whereas community in the church tradition has always been focused on opting into a community of people, a group of people to follow Jesus with them and become more like him. So what that might mean is in context of a Wednesday night, you opt into your small group, whether there's people in there you're friends with or not, whether you like your leader or not, so that you guys can all become more like Jesus together. What that means is if you come to COH Youth, your community is just as much your friends from school as it is Jim and Julie from the Snack Shack who sell you guys pizza and soda every week. Woo! Woo! Uh, your community is just as much as the guys who run security and run the cameras and the production booth and the worship team as it is your friends and your family. The community in the way of Jesus is people that you opt to be in relationship with, to be in community with, to become more like him and to practice his way. It doesn't matter if you like them necessarily, if they're your age, if they're like you or not. It is choosing to follow Jesus alongside of them that matters. That's the difference between relationships and community. And then in the, right in the center of this pyramid where we had environments before, I want you guys to write the word Holy Spirit. And the thought here is pretty simple but also pretty hard. So instead of being shaped by Locks Hatchie, Florida and wearing camo and wearing cowboy hats and all this stuff, the thought process is that you, as you practice these things, as you become more like Jesus, as you are spending time with him, your primary environment is no longer Locks Hatchie, Florida or wherever you might be or live in life but it is with the Holy Spirit and in his presence. If you remember when we talked about being with Jesus, it's about learning to be two places at once, going to school and with Jesus, walking and with Jesus, going to work and with Jesus. This is all about just learning to come back to his presence and let that shape you more than Lox Hatchie, Florida does. And please stop swimming in canals, seriously. <laughs> I'm seriously concerned about that. You guys need to get a test it or something. Um, all this is to say is if we do this, if we lean into this, we can become more like Jesus. This is like theory of change that is scientifically and psychologically proven that is just applied to following Jesus. And I think there's a couple oppositions that you might hear in church that might go against this naturally. I think the first myth is that all you need is the Bible. Has, have you guys ever heard that before? You're just told, read your Bible more and you'll become more like Jesus. Handful of you guys, this is good. The Bible is good. Don't hear me say, don't read your Bible. Don't hear me say the Bible is not good. The Bible is good. 
I think one of the most formative things you could do for the rest of your life is read your Bible every day. The Bible is good. But it is also a myth to think that all you need to do is read your Bible and you'll become more like Jesus. Right? How many of you guys go to school and like actually read the homework assignments you're given? Do you, does reading your biology textbook make you a biologist? No. 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 Does reading your history book make you a historian? Yes. No. No. Does reading a chemistry book make you a chemist? No. no. So why do we think if we read the Bible and that's all we do, that we are instantly like Jesus? Why do we apply the same logic that just like gathering information will make us become like Jesus? If information transfer alone was enough, then you and I would be the holiest people in the world if we just read our Bible consistently, right? The Bible is good. I want to just like overemphasize that the Bible is good. You need to read your Bible. But following Jesus is so much more than that. And the second myth that I often hear in the church world is you don't need to do anything, it's God. Have you guys heard that before? Maybe you've heard like a version of it, it's like let go and let God. Have you heard that before? Or maybe Jesus take the wheel. That's a little bit more popular and famous. That was, that was nice. I appreciate that. Uh, but this is also a myth. This comes from that famous idea of let go and let God or Jesus take the wheel. And the idea here is not like, God has nothing to do with this. It's God is very much so in this and it takes his work in your life to fully transform you to become like Jesus. But it's, instead of it saying let go and let God, it should more accurately be say, without him, we can't. And without us, he won't. Without him, we can't. And without us, he won't. And what I wanted to hear, hear that, guys, is we both have parts to play. God has a role in this and we have a role in this. You have to own your faith and your walk with Jesus as much as you have to expect God to work in you as you do that. Uh, Dallas Willard is a like, famous great philosopher of the Christian faith. He said it like this, grace isn't opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Just think about that for a second. So like the free grace of salvation that Jesus offers us, you don't have to earn it. There is nothing you could do to earn that. Jesus offers that freely. But it's also not opposed to earning, or effort, sorry. It's also not opposed to effort. Meaning, grace doesn't mean you don't have a part in this. Grace doesn't mean you don't do the things of Jesus. You don't practice his way. You don't read your Bible. You don't go to church. Grace means you do these things joyfully because of the free gift he has given you in love. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. That is the second myth, is that it's all up to God. It's pretty simple. You are going to change over time. You are going to become like Jesus if you work this process and you commit to a lifestyle oriented around this intentional training. And the thing I want to hear, I want to like kind of caution you guys with is life's hard sometimes, right? Like life can be hard. As you kind of go into this and you sit under teaching, there might be times where it's confusing or it's hard to hear or it doesn't line up with the way you think about the world. There's going to be times where the practices that you might try to do just don't seem to work. Anybody been there before? You try to read your Bible and you're like, what's going on? And there's going to be times where you're in your small group or any other kind of community and it's messy because people are messy. It happens. And what I want to caution you with is when that happens, it's normal and you should not give up because life's messy or because you hear something confusing or it just gets hard or it doesn't seem to be working. That is just part of life and becoming like Jesus. And so all that is to say, as you kind of lean into this, have grace for yourself and for your community. Because you're going to mess up. Your community is going to mess up. I'm going to mess up. Your leader is going to mess up. Your parents are going to mess up. It's part of life. So have grace for yourself and for your community as you try to become more like Jesus so that we each and all can become more like him and become fully trained. So as we close in prayer, I just want to invite you guys uh, just all to close your eyes. Everybody take a deep breath. Take one more slow or deep breath. Everybody's eyes closed. And if you're comfortable for a moment, just lay your hands open in front of you as just like a posture of surrendering. And there's nothing magical about putting your hands out like this. It's just a posture of saying, Jesus, I'm here and I'm ready. 
And just for a moment, say to yourself the one thing that you might be hesitant about with this or you might be afraid of giving over to God to become more like him. And then take another deep breath and say, Jesus, you can have it. I want to be more like you. So Father, tonight, as we sit here and say that we want to become more like you, Lord, as we start to try to reorient our lives around intentionally becoming like you, we ask for your help and we ask for your grace in that, Lord. We ask that you guide us through this moment, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.